those words in that song even so come lord jesus come is that your prayer this morning i hope that is your prayer and that we are the church ready and working and willing to do whatever god asks us today scripture this morning is found in hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16 it says this so then since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven jesus the son of god let us hold firmly to what we believe this high priest of ours understands our weakness for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. This is the word of the Lord. We're singing about grace this morning. One of my favorite topics. Sing this with us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas great. Thank you. 
said, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Shall soon the earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will. the lamb who was slain worthy is the lamb who was slain and worthy is the king who conquered the grave and worthy is the lamb who was slain and worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king
Amen. Aren't you glad for grace this morning? You may be seated. As we were singing about grace this morning, I was, uh, I was looking, I, I was like, not this morning, but as I was preparing for this week, I was looking, okay, what, 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 what do we believe about grace? What scriptures do we have about grace? Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Then I read about some people who were really smart and see what they said about grace. And here's a few that I really like. Jerry Bridges said, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. Nothing we can do, but his grace is sufficient. Amen. Rick Warren said, what gives me the most hope every day is God's grace. Knowing that his grace is going to give me the strength for whatever I face, knowing that nothing is a surprise to God. Is that something you can hold on to this week? You got something coming up that you hope God knows about it, and you've been telling him about it, and I promise he does know about it. And John Newton, we already sang this, and he said it about as well as anybody could. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Amen? This is not a new song. This is an old song. Well, to some of you, it's going to be new. Because anything newer than 50 years old is new to some of you. But this is not a new song. And I've been singing this in church, I suppose, for 10, 15 years. And I have found myself in the middle of difficult times sometimes. Raising my hand and say, Lord, your grace is enough. For whatever's going on in my life, I believe that your grace is enough. You might be singing this this morning. You might sing it as a as a celebration because you've just come through something and his grace was sufficient for your needs. But maybe you're about to face something or maybe you're in the middle of something right now and you're saying, Lord, I believe. Maybe you're predicting and you're saying, God, I believe that your grace is going to meet this need of mine. Wherever you are, would you stand with us as we sing? Your grace is enough. Aren't you glad? Great is your faithfulness, oh God.
sing that said amen. amen this morning as we go to prayer we're giving thanks for that grace that has been extended to every one of us in recent days in recent weeks no i don't have to go past a day do i we have experienced his grace his touch his goodness every day every moment we're giving thanks today that a rescue is going on in thailand if you have not heard the news, well, the latest that I heard about 30 minutes before the service was that, was that six of the young boys have been uh, taken out of the cave and they're working toward getting the rest of them out. We're giving thanks for that. We're also praying and giving thanks for Diana Nichols coming through a heart procedure uh, successfully on Friday. Continuing to pray for John McFarland, for Bobby Stallings, 
praying for Glenda Romine, who has a couple of procedures coming up regarding some skin cancers. Extending our sympathy to the family and friends of Martha Brown. We have students in summer ministry, some of them here in Arkansas, some of them around the world. And we're praying for all of them. Praying for Vacation Bible School, which starts a week from today. Lots of things that we're praying for. But as part of our prayer today, would you make sure you say thank you. Say thank you to God for his grace, his goodness, his touch on your life. And as we pray, if you'd like to come and kneel at the altar during this time, you're welcome to come forward as we sing. Grace, grace, God. says God's riches at Christ's expense Father that grace has been extended to us and offered to us at a cost it didn't come as cheap grace it came to us as a gift from you but it cost the life of your son on a cross buried in a tomb but that wasn't the end of the story. The end of the story is the resurrection power that you exhibited in bringing him back to life after three days. And we give thanks for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of the grace that you make available to all of us. Thank you for being such a gracious and loving God. Thank you for being one who is always with us and always impacting our lives. Thank you for being the God who stands by us in time of need. Thank you for being the God who celebrates with us when we experience victories. Because those victories have come from you. They've been made possible because of you. So in the good times, in the tough times, you're the God who's with us and may we never forget it. May we never ignore you. May we never overlook that which is ours because of you. And Father, this morning, there are some who have come into this sanctuary with needs and burdens that are so heavy they can hardly stand up under them there are others who have had answers to prayer this week that burdens have been lifted no matter what the case no matter what the situation we've come to this place knowing that we need you we need you in a in a divine way we need you to speak to our hearts we need your voice to be heard we need your love your peace, your goodness, your power, your strength to be extended to us. And we've come to this place to take advantage of the opportunity of gaining those very things in these moments together. We also need the strength that we gain from having fellowship with one another. And I pray that as we visit together, as we talk together, as we share needs and concerns, as we tell our stories to one another today, that we will strengthen one another with what we have to say and with our interactions. As we continue to pray for all of these requests that are on this prayer list, we especially lift our Bible school to you. We give thanks for what you've done through children's camp and teen camp in the past few weeks. And now Bible school is coming up. One more opportunity this summer to make a major impact in the lives of children. Would you prepare the workers? Would you prepare the children for what you have for them in these days of special emphasis on Bible study? Again, Father, we need you. Spoken request, unspoken request, we need you. And we acknowledge that today. May your will be done in our lives. May your power be seen. May your miracles be testified to. And for all that you do, we will thank you and praise you for it's in your great name that we ask this today. The name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Sing this one more time before you sit down. Sing in grace. be seated. Well, let me welcome you to this service. So thankful that you're here. Thank you for coming, for being part of this day and this time. For those of you who may be worshiping with us for the first time, we want to offer you and extend to you a special welcome and ask that if you did not have the opportunity to register as a guest this morning that you take time to look in the front of your worship folder and at the bottom of the front page is a response form if you just put your name and some contact information on there we would like to make contact with you personally in the coming week and tell you how glad we were that you came today i'd like to ask the ushers to come and help us as we worship through giving the paying of our tithe the giving of our offering Thank you for the way you're, you're helping us in these days, both with your online giving and your giving in this capacity, or for some of you who have been on vacation and you just mailed it in. We still take checks via U.S. mail. That's a possibility as well. Whatever you choose, thank you for being good stewards, faithful stewards of your time, your talent, and your treasure. Father, we take a moment to give back to you today just a portion of what you have blessed us with and pray that you will take our offering and do with it more than we ever imagined. We place it in your hands lovingly because you so generously and lovingly gave it to us in the first place. Make a difference in your kingdom with what we give today, we pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. So this is a, a worship song, and I want you guys to do whatever you want to do. Part of the song you'll know, part of the song you won't. So if you want to sing, if you want to do whatever, you're more than welcome to. It's not going to hurt my feelings because that's why we're here. No grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice And seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard And through it all Well, it is well. 
Thank you, Lindsay, for sharing your testimony and leading us in worship. And thanks to all of you for your help with the offering today. I hope that you can do more than just sing the words to that song. I hope that it is a true testimony from your heart that it is well. Because of his great grace, we can sing, it is well. But what about those who can't sing that song? What about those we know who are outside the bounds of grace? What about those who have never taken advantage of the plan of salvation? What do we do for them? How do we get the good news to them? 
Well, we're continuing to talk about raising the temperature, and we're not talking about the, the outside air temperature. We're talking about the outreach temperature of you as an individual, of us as a congregation. How do we raise the temperature? And I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 9. Begin our reading with verse 9, and let's stand as we read together. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, remember, he's already called out a few people to be followers of his, but they are fishermen. There's no big deal about being a fisherman. There are other occupations represented. There's no big deal about that. But a tax collector, uh, he just stepped over the line, did he not? Tax collectors are some of the most despised individuals in the Jewish society. They make their, love, make their uh, money by collecting more than is due. They collect enough for the government, and then they collect another amount for themselves. They don't care for tax collectors. So when Jesus decided to call a tax collector to be one of the top 12 on his list, think that through. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Glad to have a new occupation. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, whoa, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? They could have just said sinners, but no, they had to throw in tax collector. But listen to the response. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Father, in these moments... We not only want you to speak to our hearts, we want you to challenge us. Challenge us at the level of our faith. Challenge us at the level of our compassion. Challenge us at the level of our outreach. Challenge us at our concern for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior. Let your voice be heard above all others. As we spend these moments together, we pray in your great name. Amen. Last week, we spent time reminding ourselves of how important lost people are. And I gave you a graph. And I ask you to spend this week kind of thinking through that whole process of what it means to raise the outreach temperature of your life. I don't know where you started. I don't know what you did this week that increased it by maybe one degree or three degrees, but I hope that something happened. And just to remind you, this is not a comparison game. You're not comparing yourself with anybody else. You're only asking God to show you where you stand on the scale, on the temperature scale between one and a hundred, and what can be done in your life on a weekly basis to increase it. I'll be honest with you. There are going to be weeks that instead of increasing, it decreases. But if we're paying attention to it every week, and if we're paying attention to our outreach temperature on a regular basis, there will be more increases than there will be decreases. And we will continue to grow in our concern and our compassion and our awareness of our personal ability to reach out and touch the lives of those who are far from Christ. All of us, all of us, if we're honest, could raise the temperature a few degrees in each of our lives, and I'm including myself. And the result is, if all of us as a congregation do it, then as a congregation, the whole temperature goes up for us as a church, does it not? That doesn't take a scientist to figure that one out. If it happens to you, it increases the outreach temperature for the whole church. If it happens to me, if it happens to several of us, it increases it even more. And we're paying attention to the outreach temperature. There have been a couple of events 
just this week that have caused me to examine my own outreach temperature. The first was the funeral of Martha that was held yesterday. Anytime I attend a funeral, and I'm sure you do the same thing, there's some personal inspection and introspection that goes on. Even when I'm preaching a funeral, I'm oftentimes aware of what I've said about a person and wondered what would be said about me. Wondering, how have I lived? What difference have I made in my personal area of influence in the name of Jesus Christ? Funerals cause us to think about our own short life, if you will. The other event is the news that we've been receiving from Thailand for the past two weeks. Twelve boys and their 25-year-old soccer coach have been trapped in a cave for more than two weeks. And if you happen to get a buzz on your, your phone or your device this morning, it alerted you to the fact that six of them have already been rescued, and we're thankful for that and praying for the other seven to come out safely. I'm anxious to follow up on this and find out exactly what they have done because some of those young boys didn't even know how to swim. And in order to be rescued, they've got to take a quick lesson not only in swimming, but in scuba diving. Talk to Kenny and Vicki or any of our other scuba divers in the group and you'll know they didn't learn it overnight. That, that's amazing to me. But the miracle in the beginning was that they had been found. I mean, miles and miles of, of ways to, to move and navigate through this cave, and they found this soccer team and their coach two weeks ago. Now, I don't have any training in underwater cave rescue. I don't live in Thailand. I don't have any mining skills that would allow me to go volunteer as a strategic miner in regard to trying to come up with a way to get these young men out of this cave. But if my child or if my grandchild happened to be in that cave, you can be sure my rescue temperature would go up in a hurry. Wouldn't yours? If that was your child, if that was your grandchild, what would you be doing that's different if you knew that they were trapped in that cave and they were having trouble finding a way to get them out. The rescue temperature of your life would go up tremendously. I might not be trained in a specific way that was needed, but I can assure you I'd be doing something. I'd be leading a prayer meeting outside the mouth of that cave. I'd be Googling cave rescue and see what others have done to rescue other people who have been trapped and lost in caves before. And when I found out where they were, I'd ring their phone. I would, you don't ring phones anymore, do you? I'd call them on their cell phone and find out what they did and how they worked and what plans they used and, and how the rescue happened in their situation. And is there anything to be learned and anything that could be done that would aid in rescuing these young boys? I'd be finding people who had been in those caves before and who know the layout of the cave and to find out if there is a different passageway that leads to my boy. My temperature would be going up day by day. And when I thought I had done all I could possibly do, I would look for more ways to make a difference. I wouldn't quit exploring the possibilities and trying to find a way to save those boys. Well, while experiencing a crisis is a good way to raise your outreach temperature, it doesn't take a crisis to make the temperature to go up. But for the sake of discussion this morning, there are people that you know and there are people that I know who are trapped in a cave. And they have been trapped there way too long. They wandered in and didn't realize that the floods would come. And now they're trapped. They're trapped in a life of sin. They're trapped in a life that they cannot be freed from, at least on their own. Somebody's got to come to the rescue. And Jesus said, I didn't come to save the righteous. I didn't come to call the righteous. 
I came to rescue the sinners. I came to rescue those who are trapped in a life of sin. I came to rescue those who have been ensnared in a lifestyle that they never intended to get into. They never had any idea that it would end up the way it has. And now they need someone to come alongside them and show them there's a better way. That there's a better way of living and a better way of, of having peace of heart. So what can we do to increase the chances of helping our friends and neighbors who are trapped in the cave, who are trapped in the life of sin? Well, the first is simply this, engage in prayer consistently. Oh, pastor, we pray all the time. I know you do. But do you pray for lost people? Do you pray for people who are far from Christ? Or do you pray only about those personal concerns that you have? Pray consistently that God will raise your outreach temperature, that He will show you and develop within you an awareness of those people who are around you who are in need and give you a heart of greater compassion than you've ever known before. It can be additional time spent in prayer, and it may be that you add a few minutes to your devotional time every day. It could be that you do something a little more creative than that. Perhaps a one 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 prayer. One person who's on your prayer list at 1 o'clock for one minute every day. Set some kind of reminder, put it on your calendar. Maybe 1 o'clock doesn't work for you. Choose a time that does. I know of a person that instead of one 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 prayers... They pray at 9 o'clock at night. That's when everything slows down at their house, when everything gets a little better, uh, and it's easier for them to move into a room by themselves and have prayer. And at 9 o'clock, they pray for one person for one minute. They call it a 911 prayer. You can come up with whatever little gimmick works for you, but something to help you remember to pray for lost people. Set a reminder to pray for God to draw these people to himself and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to them, to soften their hearts and to draw them to Jesus. Then add to that a very bold prayer. This will be very bold on your part. Cry out to God to do whatever needs to be done that they might see their need for a Savior. That's a bold prayer not because of God's working on the other person, but because of what God may ask of you. When you pray that prayer, you may be the very answer to that prayer. And God may direct your path and direct your steps and direct your days to have more contact and more interaction with that individual than you've ever had before, and you're wondering why. It's because you prayed this prayer. God, do something. Do whatever is needed that they might see their need for a Savior. We don't know what he'll do. We don't know how he will answer that prayer. But that is a bold prayer when we, when we release, when we commit hands down our friends, our loved ones, the people who are on our prayer list into God's care and say, God, do whatever you need to do in order to capture the attention of this person spiritually. And then pray that your heart will go out to the person you're praying for. And then let me add another dimension to this. If you have children, begin to ask them who they have in their classes at school, who they have on their soccer team, their baseball team, their basketball team, who they have in their circle of influence who does not know Christ. And then teach them how to pray for their lost friends. Teach them how to pray for friends who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. And watch what begins to happen, not just to their friends and not just to your children, but watch what happens in your home as in your home you're beginning to pray for those who are not connected to Christ. You'll be amazed at how passionately and how naturally your children will join in this ministry of prayer. And then the second, 
make time to be with those who are far from God. I read a quote this week that said, I'm convinced that many Christians don't do much outreach because they don't really know many non-believers. They went on to say that too many Christians live inside a Christian bubble. They live isolated lives. They are so intent on spending time with other Christians that they never spend time with non-Christians. The gospel is about a God who came to a non-believing world and invited one of the most rejected individuals in society to be one of the top 12. When he called Matthew to be a disciple, to be one of the 12, that was way outside the box. But he knew that spending time with this man, who up to this point had lived a pretty despised life, he knew that spending time with him could make a difference in his life, and Matthew would in turn make a difference in the lives of many that he came in contact with after he built the relationship with Jesus Christ. Make time to be with those who are far from God. And here are some ways we can be more Christ-like and get outside the bubble. I'll tell you, I don't do all of these. I'm throwing them out as suggestions. You find the one that fits you, and if none of these fit you, so be it. But think up something that does fit you, that moves you out into a place where you can extend God's grace and live out His life of compassion for you. Join a local gym. It'll be good for your friends to have you praying for them while you're there, and it'll be good for you. That was a joke. <laughs> Not to join the gym. <laughs> Just Join a civic organization. Not only do we, need, do we meet non-believers, but we also make our difference in our community as we're part of one of the civic organizations in our community. Coach a sports team. And if you're really brave, coach a sports team that's not part of a Christian organization. You will have all kinds of opportunities to be a witness before children, before parents, before grandparents. You can teach the members of your team how God would, act, would expect someone to lose a game. There's a gracious way of winning and a gracious way of losing. And some of those lessons need to be taught to our young people by some Christian models. Have regular dinners with unchurched neighbors. Intentionally get to know your neighbors by having a monthly dinner with a different family each month. There are people who will come to your home who will not come to church with you. Did you know that? There are people who will come to your home for a meal who will not come come to church with you, but coming to your home and building a relationship with you could lead them to Christ. See your co-workers with the eyes of Jesus as sheep without a shepherd, and we talked about that last week. You might find that you're already working in a mission field and you just need to raise the outreach temperature. I attended a conference, a Palcon conference at SNU a couple of weeks ago. One of the gentlemen who prayed before one of the sessions put a, put a phrase in his prayer that grabbed my heart. It was not part of the session. It was, not, it, it was part of a prayer. And he said, God, help us to remember that our address is not an accident. That spoke to me. I hope it does to you as well. In all of these ideas, whatever idea you choose to expand your, your outreach and raise the outreach temperature of your life, start thinking that your address is not an accident. Your job is not an accident. The school you attend is not an accident. Your circle of friends, that's not an accident. And then third, tell your stories. When you are with other believers... We need to spend time telling the stories of how God is answering prayer. Now, don't, don't break a confidence. If someone has told you something in confidence as part of a prayer concern, a new, a new person you're reaching out to, by all means, don't go tell their story and break their confidence. 
But there are plenty of things that you can tell that are going on as you are praying for other people. There are plenty of things that you can tell about how God is answering prayer. There are plenty of things that you can tell about what God is doing in your heart while you are reaching out to that other person. And as believers, we gain strength from one another from hearing our stories. We celebrate together. We, we highlight what God is doing in not only our lives, but the lives of others. And that becomes an encouragement for others to raise their outreach temperature. And let me just go ahead and say it. Talking like this should be normal and natural when speaking to our church and our Christian friends. We ought to be quick to tell what God is doing, quick to tell how God is working, quick to tell how God is answering prayer, quick to tell how God has stood behind, beside us in tough times, quick to tell of our experiences and our testimonies of what God is doing in our lives. You see, people are waiting. They're stuck in caves. They're stuck in emotional prisons. They're stuck in a life that seems to be going nowhere. They're waiting to be rescued. They're hoping someone will find them because they've tried everything they know and they're at a dead end and the waters have come up and there's no way out and they're looking for someone who will swim in and help free them. Is it you? Jesus was pretty radical in his calling of the twelve. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and with his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Father, right now, would you impress on every one of our hearts at least one name? One individual that we do not know, that we know who does not know you? One name who needs a compassionate friend? Put on our hearts one name that we can pray for every day. Maybe for just one minute a day. But in doing so, lifting them to you because we know that as we intercede for them in prayer, you make a difference. Father, I pray that you would give us just one name. One more name, perhaps, for some people. Just one. But if every person in this congregation led one more person to you, what a difference it would make. And then one more. And then one more. And on and on and on the story goes. Help us to be aware of those who are around us. Help us to be aware of their spiritual condition. Help us to be aware of how we can be used to impact their lives for you. And for what you do, for the way you use us, for the way you raise the temperature of our outreach, we'll give you thanks. We will praise you. We will celebrate the victories that are experienced in your great name. For it's in the name of Jesus that we ask this today. And all the people said, Amen. Let's stand together. Sing this 
dance with us. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in all and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all peace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings lift it out this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King glad for grace this morning. You may be seated. Let me tell you about a few things coming up. Uh, it's in September 21st and 23rd. Uh, the, NAR the NARC, if you don't know what NARC is, that's North Arkansas Nazarenes, okay? And um, when I first heard NARC, I thought, that's not a good thing, right? But around here, I guess it is a good thing. So, um, but th this is the best thing. This is the, the our women's ministry around here is so good, both at the local church level and at the district level. And I picked this up uh, up there. And the reason why we're telling you about this so far in advance because you have to plan because they need to book the rooms and everything else because it's all the way in Branson, Missouri, and you can't get there from here very easily. So, but th th there's a whole write up here about this woman. Shannon did a fabulous job. Author of three books, uh, master. I don't care about that. Okay, don't go because of Shannon. Go because it's a wonderful event. They've have, they have different speakers every year, and every year the women come back and say, oh, that was so good. 
That was so good. And it's not because of the speakers. The speakers, they contribute to it, but it's because you're together and because everybody's putting their hand on the pump and you're sharing life together and you're sharing experiences and you're sharing God's grace with each other. That's the reason you go. Not because of Shannon. God bless her. Don't tell her I tore up her paper. But go because it's a good thing. And every year, I'm telling you, every year they change speakers, and every year the ladies come back. I believe that was the best one we ever had. And they've had some nationally known speakers, and they've had some that weren't so nationally known, and it doesn't matter, okay? So go for, go for the right reason. Go because it's the thing to do, and you're going to grow. That's why you need to go. Today, there is a swimming pool. There, there, well, there's always a swimming pool at Stallings Pool. Today, grades 1 through 6 are invited to be there, okay? So you can all be honorary Stallings today, 3 to 5. I wish I was in grade two or three. VBS is coming up. Watch this. Are you amped? How about the rest of you? Are you amped? That starts a week from today. Parents of children in those grades, four years old to sixth grade, they would like for you to register ahead of time. That would help them an awful lot. There's, there's uh, packets over in the Children and Youth Building. So if you can sign up and let them know. But plan on bring, having your kid here next Sunday, the 15th through Wednesday, the 18th. And it's going to be a wonderful time. So take advantage of that. Lives are changed through VBS. How many were saved at VBS? Can you, can you raise your hand? Cancel the VBS. There's no need. You, some of you went to, some of you asked Jesus into your heart. You just don't remember it because you're too old, okay? But you did. Believe me, lives are changed through VBS. So plan on bringing your kid and volunteering, okay? You need to volunteer. We still need volunteers. Talk to Miss Robin or Miss April is her name. Last week her name was Amy. This time her week her name is April. And I was told so many times. Thank you so much for being here. Grab a cup of coffee. Go to Sunday school. Have a good day.